our belief is that uh, one of the best ways to uh, get through these life-changing experiences that uh, are labeled, various labels, is by building community and by finding like-minded people. Labeling is such a powerful action that it profoundly and invariably affects the way we perceive ourselves and how we are received by society. I think we need to look more deeply than labels. And one of the things that we can do is start to look at the context that people um, are in when they first have that experience. And that's, for those of us who've been through struggling with hospitalizations and things that got labeled psychosis, that's a, something really powerful to ask yourself. When I first had that experience, before I had the label, before I was told this is a disease, this is a disorder, what was it that was happening in my life? Uh, most patients do not show signs of a pathological disturbance. Rather, they are sad, lonely, anxious, frustrated, disillusioned, confused, scared. All in all, they seem very human, suffering from some of the mood changes that are endemic to the human experience. In the vast majority of these cases, major social and environmental factors are the clear precipitants of their symptom symptoms. There's been a death in the family, a divorce, a job loss, substance abuse. I sometimes have to ask myself, why, why is this person coming to my clinic to seek my help with these problems? It seems like their problems might best be addressed with a counselor, or a pastor, a social worker, or even just a friend in the healing effects of time. But in America, with the way our mental health and society has evolved, mental distress has been labeled as a biological disease. And thus, when patients suffer from emotional distress, they come to their doctor's office for help. So the, the pervasiveness of the whole therapy world has convinced non-therapists that they can't really do anything much for people who are suffering. So they don't try. And I want to say, what happened to friendship? We used to call it friendship. We need to do these things for each other. I had my mood stabilizer and my antidepressant. And then I had my antipsychotic and my benzo to get me to bed at night. And at one point I was also on an anti-narcoleptic because I couldn't stay awake during the day. But then I was on um, a sleep medication at night because I couldn't go to sleep at night. And literally it was just, it was just insanity. But I didn't challenge anything because I felt so hopeless and I didn't have anyone that I felt connected to. So I just took this label on, um, hook, line, and sinker. Psychiatric diagnosis um, could not be farther from scientifically based. There is no science in the book. That a lot, sometimes I get into debates with these folks and say, but you don't have any biochemical markers for any of these things. It's hard for a lot of people to accept it's a medical condition when you keep throwing out that it had to, something to do with too much dopamine and then you retract that five years later and you throw this, uh, this one gene over here and then somebody goes along and finds out it was a study with only three people in it and it was garbage. And it's all pseudoscience. You have no biochemical markers, okay? We believe so completely this officially endorsed version of reality, this biochemical model of psychiatric illness, that when a patient manifests symptoms that faintly correspond with five of the nine criteria listed in the DSM for depression, and we pronounce them diseased. We slap a label on them and we feel justified, in spite of there being no evidence of physiological dysfunction. Then, as a matter of course, we hand them a prescription certain that we are providing them with the very best treatment available, even though there is no evidence of its long-term efficacy and plenty of known risks. A lot of people have a really hard time saying no to their doctors because it's a pretty frightening thing to do. A lot of times it's a cultural and contextual piece. I mean, there's power balance issues. Um, and so it's like, so how do you teach people how to say no in a different way? So I come up with some other um, ways to do it. One is, I don't think so. And I love that one because you can say that in so many different ways and you can have a lot of fun with it. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, you just, there's all kinds of ways you can do and get the same point across in a not so confrontive a way. Um, another one is, is, let me think about it because we all know when people think about things. <laughs> The answer is definitely no. One time I had this um, image 
of, if you imagine psychiatric diagnosis, the whole enterprise of it, as a sphere. And in it, it's you know, supposed to be filled with science, right? But if you take out well, what the fake science, um, then you've got this void. Now, what goes into that void? Every kind of bias you can imagine. So, sexism, racism, classism, homophobia, and heterosexism, ageism, ableism, looksism, I mean, absolutely everything. And, what, and whatever happens to be in that therapist's mind, because, as you know, most of the criteria in the DSM, they have terms like marked, marked anxiety, right? Well, what's marked? Who decides? It's your therapist. My problem was essentially <clears throat> isolation and powerlessness. And that really is what I think what we call mental illness is. is I, people are isolated and feel powerless. And to overcome that, listening is the key to under, overcoming that, making those human connections. Connection so. is a really powerful, uh, very powerful quality. And connection is what a lot of us actually become very short of. Uh, because of our diagnosis, because of the way we feel about ourselves, because of what we lose, because we're living in this fast, rapidly isolating society where technology is, you know, uh, advancing faster than we can actually think about how we're going to create relationships uh, that are effective. And many, many people end up in a psychotic episode, an extreme crisis, as a result of the building, building pressure of conflicts with their families. Family issues are really, really important to look at. I don't think we need to blame families. I don't think families are the cause because there's intergenerational problems. Families have problems from their families. Parents have problems from their parents. But one of the most terrible things that we've done by labeling things symptoms and signs of disease is to cut ourselves off from seeing people who are in crisis in the context of their families and getting help with their family conflicts and being able to communicate and talk about what's going on, everybody be heard. Suicidal thinking became a habit for me. Um, you know, partly because it was easier to think about death and nothingness than it was to think about what was going on and the pain and the difficult stuff. Partly because actually I learned to speak suicide by being in the system. Nobody listened to me unless I said the yes word. So, you know, suicide became my language for very big, very strong feelings, overwhelmed, despair, hopelessness, you know, all that sort of thing. And yes, please. I don't think that that's necessarily um, a, a conscious thing at all. Absolutely not. When stuff gets constructed that way, when we learn how to think that way, it becomes real for us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we can then distinguish whether we're actually, what we're actually feeling. Mm. And so we become, you know, suicidal for lack of better language, because we just don't have any other way to talk about it. That's what it turns out that a lot more people in our society have suicidal feelings than anyone wants to admit. It's very taboo. It's hidden. People are afraid of talking about it for seeming, seeming weak, or being locked up, or being people overreacting and getting scared, not knowing what to do. But what I've seen in the people that I've talked with, my friends, peers in our support groups, and also now the, the people that I work with as a therapist, is that suicide is not someone giving up on life. Suicidal feelings are a very, very strong, desperate need for a change in life. You're actually holding out for something that you want different. You want a better life. It's not that you don't want a life, you want a better life, but you feel utterly powerless to make that change. And I often, I often see how struggling with suicide, exploring the feelings of suicide, can be the beginning of someone actually having a reawakening where they contact their deeper purpose and really what gives them meaning and gives them a sense of I want to live by confronting what it is that they need to change in their lives and helping them to connect with people and get the support they, they need to start making steps on those on those changes. And I think that we have to really open to to the diversity in human experience. I mean people may not know this, but did you know that the that the diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia uh, prior to like 1950, 1960, used to mostly fit housewives. It was like you were depressed, you were withdrawn, you didn't want to do your housework, you were sad. Okay. So then, then the civil rights movement comes along. Okay, it's the Black Power movement, 
the uprisings, the riots, the marches, black power is here. So they decide to revise the definition of schizophrenia, so now anger, paranoia is now considered schiz schizophrenia. But basically, black protest was being turned into a disease, or something that happened. And so I think we really need to recognize that there is a, a, an anti-diversity move that happens from psychiatry and happens from, from taking the, the unique expressions of what it is to be human and the richness of that and then turning it into a disease and a symptom and a disorder. We suffer and then we recover. We may need to remove toxic influences. We may need to use a cast or a surgery or a pill for a short while. But the impetus is towards healing and wholeness. And this happens spontaneously for the body as well as the mind. Here is hoping for continued progress towards this healthier paradigm of mental wellness. One of the symptoms that I had that was, that was considered schizophrenia was hearing voices. But in some cultures, if you don't hear voices, you're considered to have a problem. And hearing voices is being in contact with the spirit world, being in contact with nature, being in contact with the, um, with the ancestors, so. You know, the traditional view is that you hear voices, that's it. You're sick, you're done. Back war, rest of your life. Schizophrenia, bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a recovery process that has been well documented, well researched, and um, you know, I've gone through it, and other people have gone through it and so you can get to the other side. I feel so grateful to have had all the experiences that I had, all the pain that I experienced. I couldn't be more grateful for it um, because I think I'm a better person today. I'm in a place where I can hopefully help other people figure out who they are away from just picking up a label and a bottle of pills because we're so much more than that. We're complex, as the other speakers have said, we're complex human beings and we all share the same emotions no matter how different we all are. They're not to be labeled, they're to be talked about and communicated. People who have moved into individual recovery, from, that, you know, from being marginalized in many ways economically, socially, is they, they've learned a lot of the value of social support, of having people around who really believe in them. So they really understand that. And they really understand the importance of determination and courage. Okay, and restoring self-respect and belief and hope. They need, they, they've learned that. And so for them, when they move into <coughs> democracy movements, it's easy. Those, those variables of solidarity and self-respect and determination and courage, they're, in, they're already in consciousness. Almost every, well, I shouldn't say almost. Every psychiatric survivor that I've ever known has been an anti-authoritarian. Now, maybe there are some out there who aren't, <laughs> but everyone I've ever met is. Every one of them has no problem, you know, questioning authority, and ultimately they move into challenging and sometimes and often resisting it. And I said, so they have that going for them, and that's what the movement supports. And so. And Sun Tzu, the Chinese philosopher, wrote in The Art of War that your opponent is no more dangerous than when they have no way to escape. So whenever we challenge the system or challenge some opponent, always think about ways that we can invite them to move forward and invite them to, um, to do something different so that they have a way to get out of their stuck position and go to some different role. We would have a system that emphasizes psychosocial care. Helping people go back to work, job rehab, all that sort of thing, social things. That would be where you'd focus. And over here as an adjunct, you'd have medications and you'd figure out for whom and for how long they would still be a tool, but you'd have a, a, a clear-eyed view of the limitations of that tool. And rather than being the centerpiece, they would be an adjunct to be used when needed, etc. And I point is, I think good science, if known, could help push our society to this understanding and really, quote, a revolution in how we think about psychiatric distress, how we care for it, etc. And God knows we need change. We have to work hard um, and realize, as Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight with you, and then you win. So we're at the fighting stage right now, and we need to continue to fight.
I had these beautiful insights of awareness that every time you got angry, that was actually your love being put into action. Wow. You chose to put wow. your love into action. Wow. So it's nice. We all here today could think about the idea that every time we're mad, yes. it's our love. Absolutely. Nice. That's our love. Nice. Everybody so far today has talked about how horrible isolation is. And, you know, psychologists have not proven very much about anything, but one thing that keeps coming out is to just about any kind of suffering is made worse by isolation and made better by connection, human connection. And so one of the things I want to suggest that people do is to make that respectable.